Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming out on this wonderful evening with uh, Sergio De La Pava and um, with Salman Rushdie and uh, Paul Auster, each of, uh, each of them telling us uh, a New York story, but a different kind of New York story. Um, as all of you know, Sergio is uh, the author of Lost Empress, also um, A Naked Singularity and Persone, uh, on the back of which the, the biographical information claims uh, that his claim to fame is that he does not live in Brooklyn. <laughs> or, and he still doesn't live in Brooklyn, believe it or not. He actually lives in Jersey. <laughs> See, look at that. Cheaper rant, baby. And Paul Oster was born in Jersey, but now lives in Brooklyn. He's here tonight to talk about his novel, 4321, one of, um, I think, 16 novels that you have, Paul, um, I, and several books of poetry, several screenplays, um, and uh, one of my good friends and one of the great authors of our time, along with Salman Rushdie, who's here tonight, and he lives in Manhattan. He's here tonight to talk about the, um, the Golden House, and uh, Salman has written, I think, 11 or 12 novels, several books of children's 13. literature. 13. There you go. <laughs> and, well, the two children, are you including the two, two, kid, two yeah, kids' books in that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was going to get to that. So I was right, 11, 11 novels, two, two novels for children. Are these working? They're not working? Yeah, they're working. They are? All right. Uh, screenplay, as you know, he won the Booker of Bookers, and you know there's a, a, the, a, the list of prizes that these gentlemen uh, have gotten for their uh, for their awards is about as long as a Third Avenue menu. So um, uh, Salman moved to New York, uh, best part of um, 20 years ago, 18 years ago, and uh, it's a city that uh, proudly claims them. All of these writers give me. What I would, what or what Nabokov actually would call the spinal twinge, uh, which is that that marvelous pore of cold along the spine when you come upon something that you know is just absolutely right, as if there's some sort of electrical current moving through us, and so much of that current, or at least the circuit board over which it it runs, has to do with the city of New York. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the city of New York, literature, the stories that it gives us. My name is Colin McCann, um, and I'm going to... Thank you. And, and for my sins, I actually live on the Upper East Side. <laughs> that's a lot of sins to do, to do that. Um, and we're going to ask uh, the authors to read in, uh, for, for a few minutes in alphabetical order to whet our appetite, and then we will go from there. And we will begin with uh, Sergio. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why no, I thought I, said, I was reading that. I, I, I actually, <laughs> yeah, because he's right next to me. You probably thought I was leaving. All right, never mind. A, yeah. No, so you, you haven't heard like Paul's new name is Paul Doster. All right. a, yeah. Because they like a, him so much in France. <laughs> Sorry, we're beginning with Paul Oster. <laughs> is, this, is this being recorded? Is this being recorded? I hope not. <laughs> it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, you know, open bar in the back. That might explain something. <laughs> Having a name beginning with A, of course, you get used to it in school. You're always the first one. You're the guinea pig for everybody else. Oh, anyway, I didn't know what to read. Uh, this book is, some of it is set in New York, not all of it by any means. And I had some passages that I debated about and I decided to do this one. And just to give a tiny bit of background, we're in 1966, so it's a long time ago. Um, the protagonist, Ferguson, um, is 19 years old. His girlfriend, Amy, is 19 years old. They're both students at Columbia and Barnard. She's at Barnard. And uh, the, it's the summer. School is out. And um, here is, and they've just moved in together. And so it's something new. Um, 
summer in hot, unbreathable New York, one 90-degree day after another as the broiling asphalt melted in the sun and the concrete pavement slabs burned into the soles of their shoes, the air so dense with humidity that even the bricks on the facades of buildings seemed to be oozing sweat, and everywhere the stink of garbage rotting on the sidewalks. American bombs were falling on Hanoi and Haiphong. The heavyweight champion was talking to the press about Vietnam. No Viet Cong ever called me nigger, he said, thus conflating the two American wars into a single war. The poet Frank O'Hara was run over by a dune buggy on a Fire Island beach and killed at the age of 40. And Ferguson and Amy were both trapped in boring summer jobs. Bookstore clerk for him, typing and filing for her. Low paid work that forced them to ration their Gaulois. They had been briefly to France the summer before. But Bobby George, and this is a friend of Ferguson's from childhood, but Bobby George was playing baseball in Germany. He's in the army. The West End bar had air conditioning. And once they returned to their hot, airless apartment, Ferguson could run cool washcloths over Amy's naked body and dream they were back in France. It was the summer of politics and movies, of dinners at the Schneidermans, that's her parents, apartment on West 75th Street and the Adler's apartment on West 58th Street, of celebrating Gil Schneidermans, that's her uncle. Schneidermans moved to the New York Times after the Herald Tribune shut down its presses and vanished from the scene, of going to concerts at Carnegie Hall with Gil and Amy's brother Jim, of riding the 104 bus down Broadway to the Thalia and the New Yorker to escape the heat by watching movies, which they jointly decided should always be comedies, since the grimness of the moment demanded that they laugh whenever it was possible. And who better to get them going than the Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields, or the screwball inanities starring Grant and Powell, Hepburn, Dunn, and Lombard. They couldn't get enough of them. They jumped onto the bus the minute they found out another comedy double feature was playing. And what a relief it was to forget the war and the stinking garbage for a few hours as they sat in the air-conditioned dark. But when no comedies were to be seen in the neighborhood or anywhere else, they returned to their summer project of grinding through what they called the literature of dissent, reading Marx and Lenin because one had to read them, and Trotsky and Rosa Luxemburg, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, Sartre and Camus, Malcolm X and Franz Fanon, Sorel and Bakunin, Marcuse and Adorno, looking for answers to help explain what had happened to their country, which seemed to be collapsing under the weight of its own contradictions. I'm going to skip to the next paragraph. Most of all, it was the summer of looking at Amy, of watching her put on lipstick and brush her impossible hair, of studying her hands as she rubbed body lotion into her palms and then ran those palms over her legs and arms and breasts, of washing her hair for her as she closed her eyes and sank into the lukewarm water in the tub, the ancient tub with the claw feet and the rust stains running through the cracked porcelain, of lying in bed in morning and see her dress herself in a corner of the room as light came through the window and surrounded her, smiling at him as she slipped into her panties and bra and cotton skirt, the small domestic details of living within her feminine orbit, tampons, birth control pills, the pills for when her stomach cramped up during hard periods, the household chores they did together, shopping for food, washing dishes, and the way she would sometimes bite her lower lip as they stood in the kitchen slicing and chopping onions and tomatoes for the pot of chili that would feed them for a weekend, weekend's worth of dinners. The concentration in her, in her eyes whenever she painted her fingernails or toenails, quote, to make a good impression at work. Watching her shave her legs and underarms as she sat quietly in the tub, then climbing into the tub with her and soaping down her slithery white skin, the unearthly smoothness of her skin against his hands, and sex and sex and sex, sweaty summer sex with no cover or sheet on top of them as they rolled on in the bed in her room and the creaking old fan stirred the air a bit and cooled off nothing the shudders and sighs, the yowls and groans in her, on top of her, under her, beside her, the deep laughs trapped in her throat, 
the surprise tickling attacks, the sudden snatches of old pop songs from their childhood, lullabies, dirty limericks, mother goose poems, and grumpy Amy narrowing, narrowing her eyes in another one of her snits, happy Amy gulping down ice water and cold beers, eating fast, shoveling it in like a ravenous stevedore, the snorts of laughter watching Fields and the M brothers, there ain't no sanity clause, Archie, and the magnificent ah she exhaled one evening when he handed her his translation of an early poem by René Char, a poem so short that it consisted of only six words, a brief blink entitled Lasner's Hand, which was a reference to the 19th century criminal poet who later serviced as a character in Children of Paradise. Worlds of eloquence have been lost. It could never end. The sun was stuck in the sky. A page had gone missing from the book and it would always be summer as long as they didn't breathe too hard or ask for too much. Always this summer when they were 19 and were finally, finally almost, finally perhaps almost, on the brink of saying goodbye to the moment when everything was still in front of them. I guess this requires some setup. A substantial portion of this novel occurs in, I don't know if you'd call it a neighborhood, but it occurs um, on Rikers Island, which I suspect most of you have not um, visited. <laughs> not voluntarily, anyway. Um, the setup to this is that the NFL, I, I think you all know what that is, um, is in a work stoppage, and somebody by the name of Nina Gill is trying to get a rival league up and running and she has kind of forcibly conscripted a, a recent law grad, I'm sorry, a recent Brown grad by the name of Dia Nouveau to help her. So here they are in indoor football league headquarters in Patterson, New Jersey, plotting their domination. What's wrong, asked Dia. They're alone, hour two, at IFL headquarters. Nina, who says something's wrong? Your face says, yeah, well, from now on, just worry about what my mouth says. Every time that cockamamie investigator comes by, you get some version of this, huh? Weird it out, basically. Is there something wrong with the league that I'm missing? Because w where I'm sitting, all appears to be going quite swimmingly. Moreover, as deputy commissioner, our charter dictates that not everything's the league, you know. It is for me. I have literally nothing else going on. Wait, did I just make you laugh? Let's not belabor it, shall we? I did. What a feather in my cap, don't you agree? You're so needy. I am, is that bad? Tell me about your childhood. Oh God, no. Anyway, about the league and the swimmingly. It's true that we don't yet have a TV contract, but there are definite nibbles now. In the meantime, how do you feel about broadcasting all our games via Skype? What did you just say to me? I said, vacation, you know what our vacation policy is. Just that I think I may need a couple days to recover. It's your fault in a manner of speaking. Recover from what? From Joni, what else? How are you talking about? Who's Joni? Joni Mitchell, remember? What? Why would you bring her up at this exact moment? Are you messing with me? You gave me all her albums. Told me I had to listen to them in order. Any of this ringing any bells? Oh, uh, that's right. Uh, so? So you're responsible for my psychic breakdown occasioned by listening to only Blue for the last few days. Ah, uh, I'm only half joking. I'm a bit lost. I mean, what is that thing? It just feels like, I don't know, the emptying of a soul? Listening to it is unnerving and elevating at the same time. I don't know what to do in response. Do? It has to represent another level of artistic flowering in that arena, no? You're not expected to do anything. Joni Mitchell is not a person in this world of ours. That's just it. She feels like the most important person in the world right now. Believe me, the people you know are far more important, especially since one of them is about to punch you in the face. <laughs> it feels like an interaction, Joni. It isn't. Why so defensive? You're the one who insisted I had to listen to it all like it was some religious calling. I can't be wrong once a decade. Funny part is I've never really been a big lyrics person, but she has this way of compressing so much into such few words. Poetry. Yes, that. I'm thinking of one thing in particular. I should start by describing my romantic slash sexual life first. You most definitely should not. Okay then, I'll just summarize that it has not been a rosy picture. 
Naturally, with such a decided trend, one looks for explanatory theorems. Naturally. So there's a moment where Joni wonders to a potential lover whether he will have her as she is. Of course, the brilliantly hilarious follow-up is that how she is is strung out on another man. Kind of weird, right? We laugh that no one would ever really agree to that, but why? Say I'm with someone and that's what they want. Why should they care if I'm maybe not entirely into it because of someone else? Well, they do, and I realize that maybe the reason I'm not all that into anything is that I'm still kind of hung up elsewhere, you know? There's this guy, I've never really been able to get him out of my head. He was crazy, really, he was everything at the highest level all the time, if that makes any sense. The ending was too abrupt, and so I've always felt it like just lingers, years too, but still, you know? Even now, just talking about it out loud like this, it's like my heart rate is speeding up. Oh, brother. Wonder what became of him, likely dead. Nuno DeAngelis, says Dia, slowly savoring each syllable. Get off, what? Come here, look me in the eye. They stare at each other for seconds. What? Nothing, just that the name sounds made up is all. I know, funny how people with spectacularly memorable names are always at the ready to be recalled in our minds, said Dia Nouveau. Naming's weird, like with Joni again and Little Green. Enough, please, I'm knocking off early today. To do what? To stare at one of my walls and assess my life. Seriously? No, well, the wall part's true, you know why? No, because that wall's full of dolly works, and that's what I like to look at when in need. Add the fact that my failure to add to this collection is currently exacerbating my malaise, and I think I have ample justification for my planned afternoon. If you say so, and here's the thing, Dia, I'm going to do that staring with maximum intensity, but I'm not going to then expect the clocks in our real world to start melting, or rhinos to start materializing, understand? These people are guideposts. You can't turn over anything tangible about your life to them. The same way they didn't turn anything over to anyone but just launched out in their own direction. I don't know. Silent pause. I know I do things. I've done things. It wasn't like now, Nina says. Her face is in her hands. It just wasn't. Huh? You're a happy person. Anyone looking at you would say so. You want me to teach you how to be happy? Nina laughs. That's twice in one day. Two feathers? Yes, two. I'm going to go now. You're in charge in my absence. I know, that's what deputy commissioner means. That's what I'm saying. I know, but there's no need to say it. It's just who I am. <laughs> Fine, you're not in charge. Activate the autopilot. There was one work-related thing I was hoping to convey to you before you left. Convey away. We got the armory. All hurdles have been cleared for the IFL's pork to play all their home games beginning in September at this historic location. Want to hear the press release? No. Ahem. Professional sports returns to the Patterson Armory. All hurdles have been cleared for the IFL's flagship franchise, The Pork, to play all their home games beginning in September at this historic location. Sounds familiar. Originally built as an installation for the 2nd Regiment of the New Jersey National Guard, the Armory has a long history of hosting athletic feats, in addition to its role as cog in the violent machine by which man hones his ability to kill his fellow man. <laughs> I'm not sure. As an example, the Armory was once home to the Patterson Crescents of the American Basketball League a team whose major contribution to round ball was its employment in 1948 of Larry Doby. Yes, that Larry Doby, the Patterson Knight who a year earlier had been the first player to integrate baseball's American League and now found himself playing a similar role for professional basketball. I feel you may be veering too wildly into social, which makes him some kind of American hero for sparing us the sight of too many Caucasians playing basketball. Yeah, definitely you strayed a bit afield. So, likewise, Joe Lewis, who it is rumored may occasionally have been the target of at least mild racism, graced the armory with his magnetic presence that same year. What in the? Now, the pork are proud to announce that they will add to this noble tradition of commercial corporeal contest by bringing their finely tuned athletic battalion to the armory, where it will ably prosecute its gridiron war with peerless pigskin pulchritude for tickets and then everything about how you get tickets. That's truly insane. What should I change? Who said change anything? You hearing voices now? Oh. Lock up when you leave, and, and as you do, remember and abide by our security protocols. I'm not aware of any such protocols. This place is a goddamn war zone. Oh, don't talk that way about poor Patterson. I was referring to Earth. So The Golden House is a, is a novel about a, a crazy, somewhat corrupt Indian family that relocates to New York and changes their name, conceals everything about their past, and then, and then it all comes back to bite them. And that's what 
98% of the novel's about, so I'm not going to read any of that. <laughs> um, uh, the novel is, is narrated by a young American filmmaker living in Greenwich Village in the gardens between McDougall and Sullivan Street, where, which is where a lot of the novel takes place. And, and he is, on, this is set, I mean, this is written, set like the day before yesterday. Um, and, and he's very agitated about things happening in his country. So um, he goes on these rants, and I just thought I'd read you one of his rants. And, and a little bit of it has to do with comic books. Somebody who might even have been Stan Lee said that, that you know, New York is both Metropolis and Gotham City, and that Metropolis is New York uptown on a sunny day at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and Gotham is New York below 14th Street in the winter when it's raining. <laughs> and uh, this is definitely the second one. Um, and this is like, basically he's, he's talking about living in this sort of beautiful little cocoon of the McDougal Sullivan Gardens. And, and he says, beyond the closed world of the gardens, things were getting very strange. So just to step outside that enchanted cocoon was to discover that America had left reality behind and entered the comic book universe. DC was under attack by DC. It was the year of the Joker in Gotham and beyond. I should explain that there are two playing cards in a pack of deck of cards that don't behave properly, and one of them is the Joker and the other is the Trump. And, <laughs> and, and I thought I didn't want the Trump in my book, so I'd have the joke. So the Joker runs for president, basically. Um, it was the year of the Joker in Gotham and beyond. The caped crusader was nowhere to be seen. It was not an age of heroes. But his arch rival in the purple frock coat and striped pantaloons was ubiquitous. Clearly delighted to have the stage to himself and hogging the limelight with, with evident delight. He permitted a few of his inferiors to think of themselves as future members of a Joker administration. The Penguin, the Riddler, Two-Face, and Poison Ivy lined up behind the Joker in packed arenas, swaying like doo-wop backing singers, while their leader spoke of the unrivaled beauty of white skin and red lips to adoring audiences wearing green fright wigs and chanting in unison, ha, ha, ha. The origins of the Joker were disputed. The man himself seemed to enjoy allowing contradictory versions to fight for airspace. But on one fact, Everyone, passionate supporters and bitter antagonists, was agreed he was utterly and certifiably insane. What was astonishing, and what made this an election year like no other, was that people backed him because he was insane, not in spite of it. What would have disqualified any other candidate made him his followers' hero. Sikh taxi drivers and rodeo cowboys, rabid alt-right blondes and black brain surgeons agreed, we love his craziness. No milk toast euphemisms from him. He shoots straight from the hip, says whatever he fucking wants to say, robs whatever bank he's in the mood to rob, kills whoever he feels like killing, he's our guy. It's a new day and it's gonna be a scream. All hail the United States of Joker, USJ, USJ. It was a year of hang on, holding a book, not so easy. It was a year of two bubbles. In one of those bubbles, the Joker shrieked and the laugh track crowds laughed right on cue. In that bubble, the climate was not changing and the end of the Arct Arctic ice cap was just a new real estate opportunity. In that bubble, gun murderers were exercising their constitutional rights, but the parents of murdered children were un-American. In that bubble, if its inhabitants were victorious, the president of the neighboring country to the south, which was sending rapists and killers to America, would be forced to pay for a wall, dividing the two nations to keep the killers and rapists south of the border where they belonged. And crime would end, and the country's enemies would be defeated instantly and overwhelmingly, and mass deportations would be a good thing, and women reporters would be seen to be unreliable because they had blood coming out of their whatevers. And, and the parents of dead war heroes would be revealed to be working for radical Islam, and international treaties would not have to be honored, and Russia would be a friend, and that would have nothing whatever to do with the Russian oligarchs propping up the Joker's shady enterprises. And the meanings of things would change. 
Multiple bankruptcies would be understood to prove great business expertise. <laughs> and three and a half thousand lawsuits against you would be understood to prove business acumen. And stiffing your contractors would prove your tough guy business attitude. And a crooked university would prove your commitment to education. <laughs> and while the Second Amendment would be sacred, the first would not be. So those who criticized the leader would suffer consequences and African Americans would go along with it all because what the hell did they have to lose? In that bubble, knowledge was ignorance, up was down, and the right person to hold the nuclear codes in his hand was the green-haired, white-skinned, red-slash-mouthed giggler who asked a military briefing team four times why using nuclear weapons was so bad. In that bubble, razor-tipped playing cards were funny, and lapel flowers that sprayed acid into people's faces were funny, and wishing you could have sex with your daughter was funny, and sarcasm was funny even what was called sarcasm was not sarcastic, and lying was funny, and hatred was funny, and bigotry was funny, and bullying was funny, and the date was, or almost was, or might soon be if the joke jokes worked out as they should, 1984. In the other bubble, as my parents had taught me long ago, was the city of New York. In New York, for the moment at least, a kind of reality still persevered, and New Yorkers could identify a con man when they saw one. In Gotham, we knew who the Joker was, and what had nothing to do with him, or the daughter he lusted after, or the daughter he never mentioned, or the sons who murdered elephants and leopards for sport. I'll take Manhattan, the joker sc screeched, hanging from the top of a skyscraper, but we laughed at him, and not at his bombastic jokery, and he had to take his act on the road to places where people hadn't got in, gotten his number yet, or worse, knew very well what he was and loved him for it, the segment of the country that was as crazy as he was, his people, too many of them for comfort. It was the year of the great battle between deranged fantasy and grey reality between, on the one hand, the possibly unknowable but probably existing thing in itself, the world as it was, independently of what was said about it or how it was seen, and on the other, this cartoon character who had crossed the line between the page and the stage, a sort of illegal immigrant, I thought, whose plan was to turn the whole country into a lurid graphic novel, the modern kind full of black crime and renegade Jews and cocksuckers and cunts, which were words he liked to use sometimes just to give the liberal elite conniptions. A comic book in which elections were rigged and the media were crooked and everything you hated was a conspiracy against you, but in the end, yay, you won. The fright wig turned into a crown and the Joker became the king. It remained to be seen if, come November, the country would turn out to be in a New York state of mind, or if it would, or if it would prefer to put on the green fright wigs and laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Thank you so much. Um, we're here to talk about um, New York. But of course, the stories of anywhere are really uh, also the stories of everywhere. And I'm really interested in, in, in asking um, our panel, uh, how far there New York uh, goes? Does it extend to Patterson? Does it, uh, does it extend to Newark? Does it extend to Bombay or Mumbai? Um, Paul, I want to uh, ask you, you called um, New York, this beautiful line in, in 4321, the, the dear, dirty, devouring New York, the capital of human faces, the horizontal babel of human tongues. Well, I think that's why I like living here. Um, <laughs> New York is impossible, as we know. It's a rough place to live. And yet, anywhere else in America, it just doesn't feel interesting to me. Um, this place, this crazy place, spoils you. And so I think about it. Why, why am I so attracted to it, even though part of me hates it, because it's so rough and so depressing often? Um, I think it's because the whole world is here. And I think it's maybe the only place that I know of in which um, so many people from so many different parts of the world coexist not always in terms of friendship or love, but mutual tolerance. I, I think most people in New York make an effort most of the time to get along with one another. Uh, and if you're not 
able to embrace that kind of thinking about your fellow men and women, then you shouldn't be here. I mean, it's, it, New York is not a place for, for bigots. We have them, but far fewer than you'd think in a city of eight and a half million. Um, and the amazing thing is, when you think of all the potential for conflict, uh, how not that much happens here in the end. We've had our flare-ups, but uh, it's not Belfast, it's not Sarajevo, it's not Jerusalem in New York. And um, so I've always argued in a way that in spite of the fact that most of America looks on this with uh, fear and contempt, that we are the heartland. We, are, we really represent what the United States of America is all about. And um, um, I think if some of the people who didn't live here came here a little more often and tried to understand New York, maybe they had a better sense of their own, their own country. One last thing. Years ago, 1999 and 2000, I did something called the National Story Project for NPR. It was every month um, I got on the radio and I, I, I was collecting stories, true stories, from listeners from all over the country. In that one year, I got 4,000 of them. And the interesting thing was that the only city people ever wrote about was New York. And I'm not talking about New Yorkers, but people who had maybe only visited here once, or people who had lived here long ago and were remembering their days in New York. New York, for people in Nebraska and Montana and Maine and and Arizona still has that special lure that no other city in this country has. Thank you so much, Sergio. Um, how far does your New York extend, and where does it where does it uh, well, does it, it begin it, and end? I think it extends, you know, as far as we take it, um, either in our imagination or in our art. So a large part of what I was trying to do with this novel is to extend the typical New York stories out to this place called Rikers Island, which is technically part of New York City, but is, you know, befitting of the kind of location it is, rarely if ever depicted in any way. Um, and, and I think uh, there's a lot of suggestive elements about that island, but nothing more suggestive that it's basically an island, man-made island out of landfill. It's basically where we go to throw away those segments of our society that we don't want to see. And you see a lot of kind of community outrage whenever, you know, our country wants to put a penal institution in your neighborhood, right? So mass incarceration and the, the powerful preying on the weak is very, to me, suggestive and, and as a novelist, very interesting to note that we have a literal island where we throw human beings away and try to forget about them try to forget about the cost of this war against the impoverished, this racially motivated war against um, a certain segment of undesirables. So that when you ask where does New York extend to, I'm hoping to extend it to this area. That's great. So you're, you're, you're almost like you're coming in, it's, it, 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 rather than that outward movement that we've been talking about a little bit uh, earlier, you're actually coming back into the heart of the city where, you know, you can walk across the bridge to, to, to you know, to, or, or, or you can get to Rikers in, you know, in half an hour, but it hasn't been talked about in, 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 in our literature. You can get literature. there, you have to go through security, you have to go over a bridge, right. you have to see, um, you know, razor wire mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, and you have to recognize that if you are on Rikers Island, you know, none of the promises of America or none of the, you know, admittedly laudable notions of New York have any relevance to your day-to-day -day existence. Right. Um, you're, you basically have become human garbage. So that, to me, as, as a novelist, I think, you know, one of the useful things about setting a story in New York, generally speaking, is that everybody kind of has a conception of New York. And if you're not all that interested in place as a, as a fiction writer, it's actually useful to, to set a story in New York because you don't have to talk much about New York. Mm. If you set a story in Kansas, you're going to devote some kind of psychic energy to talking about what this town in Kansas is like mm -hmm. because nobody knows what the hell you're talking about. Right. You set it in New York and you're just kind of like, it's in New York, guys, let's get to the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I was trying to kind of defamiliarize the reader by saying, it's in New York, but I bet you it's in an area of New York that you may not have visited. That's great. Salman. Well, the thing that interests me, I mean, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an immigrant, 
No. Um, I mean, I've been here 20 years, so I begin to think that maybe, maybe I'm actually here now, and I can call myself a New Yorker, etc. But, but essentially, I, I came here with suitcases, you know, and and of course, that is that experience is one of the great New York stories, you know, of people coming here with suitcases from everywhere, some from other parts of America, and many, and now increasingly from other parts of the world. And, and um, the way in which those stories, which come from elsewhere, turn into New York stories, you know, is is very interesting to me. And that could be anywhere in the five boroughs, you know. And, it, um, and arrival, I think, is the New York that I'm interested in. You know, uh, when when you come here, what happens to you, and what happens to it? Um, and um, and I think I've. It, for me, it's not so much a part of New York as different times of New York, because I think I've been, I mean, I've lived here for almost 20 years, but I've been coming here since I was very young. And when I first came here, I was like 25 in the early 70s. And that was another city, you know, which just happens to occupy the same space, but was actually very unlike this one. And I wrote about that way back when I when I was writing The Ground Beneath Her Feet. And, and then there are these other, I mean, I wrote, when I first came here uh, around the turn of the century, there was this city, I mean, one of the early lines in my novel, Fury, suggests the city boiled with money, you know? And it was that moment of enormous affluence and self-confidence in this city, which made me think of, the, of golden ages, and that golden ages in whatever city you find them in, feel eternal and actually they last for very very short periods of time mm -hmm. and i felt something about that here that i thought this is this city calling itself a city having a golden age mm -hmm. and something is going to happen and that novel was published on september 11 2001 right. you know and extraordinary and, and so then now i find myself to talking about the city after that you know um, and what? so so that, I mean, to me, it's more to do with time than, 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 than borrow. Right. It seems like we're, we're actually living in the exponential age in some ways in, in, in terms of New York and everything keeps changing quicker, yeah. faster and faster and faster. Um, you know, uh, do you, uh, can you locate an age that, 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 that we're in right now? Can you locate a temperature uh, that, that, you would, that you would talk about? I don't know. I mean, the, the problem with the current political situation in New York is that it, it expands so much to consume people's consciousness mm -hmm. uh, that it's it's very hard to see that actually it's only happened for a, a moment and whether this is just a moment or whether this is a new reality, right. I think it's not clear, yeah. you know? Uh, so it's a moment of transition, I would say, you know? And I can see that it, things could change back radically if things go one way or they could get radically worse and I, I don't know where we are really. Right. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention is that the city that I came from, Bombay originally, um, has grown enormously but the old part of the city is on a peninsula sticking into the, the sea which is almost exactly the same dimensions as Manhattan. Mm. You know, almost exactly the same length and width and and actually looks like Manhattan, mm. you know? And so I really felt, one of the things I felt about coming here was that it was very nostalgic almost, mm. you know? It looked like a city that I knew very well, but it was on the other side of the world, mm. you know? Um, and I also think the problem of being an immigrant in New York is that before you come here, you consume so much of New York right. through film and television, that when you come here, you think you know where you are, right. except you don't know where anything is. <laughs> right, which is kind of what, what, what Sergio was, what, was, was talking about just a moment ago. Uh, talking about ages and times, Paul, uh, what was your favorite sort of time period here in, 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 in New York? Oh, I don't know. I, I, you know, I've, I didn't grow up here, but my mother grew up in Brooklyn, um, and she then, at 16, moved to Manhattan. Uh, and my grandparents were there all through my childhood, right in central Manhattan. 
Um, and so New York was part of my childhood. And we're going back, I have vivid memories from the early 50s. I mean, I remember the West Side before there was Lincoln Center, you know, before they tore down all those houses and, and built all, all these new things. Um, what I think one can say about New York is that it's changing all the time and nothing is ever fixed. I mean, I was there too in high school when they tore down the old Penn Station. One of the real errors New York has made. Great crime, man. Yeah. Uh, no, it was. It was a beautiful train station. And I think the, 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 the grotesque stupidity of, and greed behind it led to the Landmarks Commission. Uh, you know, it's not easy to knock down these things anymore, thankfully. But so much has been lost that should have been saved. And we almost lost Carnegie Hall. And we almost lost Grand Central Station. As we all know, that was more recent. Um, I just keep seeing it change. I mean, um, when I was a kid in the 50s here, New York felt very safe. And then when I was a student at Columbia in Upper West Side, Morningside Heights in the mid-60s, it was extremely dangerous. Um, I mean, I remember going out on, uh, into the streets then with my fists clenched, just ready for something to happen. Um, and people were getting mugged all the time. Women were getting raped in elevators on the Upper West Side. Um, and and uh, the murder rate was rising. And then there was the crack epidemic that came in the, I suppose it was the 80s, which made uh, New York for quite a while a fearsome place to be. And right now, we're in this moment of quiet, which I, I don't think, we've ever experienced since the beginning of the 20th century. And New York was a crime-ridden place in the 19th century. And, um, and it was awfully rough through the, throughout the early part of the 20th. Then the Depression, I mean, it's never been an easy place. And right now, uh, even as they change the way it looks, uh, it's probably safer, but it's also now become a city for rich people. And this is the, the, the terrible thing about New York today is that the neighborhoods are gone and um, it's, 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 if you don't have money, you can't really survive here. I'd be really interested to, 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 think, think, uh, to hear what Sergio has to say about that. Because I, 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 I presume a lot of you know that um, Sergio also works uh, full time as a public defender in New York down on a 100, cent, 100 Center Street. Do you feel that same sort of uh, New York, or is it, is it a different one that you that, that, that you see? Well, I'm, I mean, New York. It's it's certainly true that that crime is down in New York as it is in throughout the entire country. But I still uh, recognize in New York a certain kind of aggression that I respond to and that I like. Um, I think the average New Yorker is pretty aggressive, and you don't maybe realize that unless you travel, right? And so like. <laughs> If you travel, like a lot of times, you know, you'll pop in to get a cup of coffee or something. And everything just seems like it's happening underwater, you know? <laughs> and I, always, I often feel like saying, you know that in New York we would cut your throat for taking this long to pour me a cup of coffee, right? <laughs> now, I don't know if that has seeped into my bloodstream and made me an even more impatient, aggressive person, or if that's why I like New York. Um, but... That's something that I hope never goes away. Um, that kind of, <laughs> sure, tolerance and all that stuff is nice, but I also just like, you know, you know, getting cursed out for getting in someone's way when they're coming off the subway or something like that. <laughs> See, but I just wanted to, I, I, I just wanted to interrupt. I, I actually disagree a little bit um, <laughs> because, um, you know, I don't go to criminal court every day like I no, do. No. I'm not even talking about crime. I'm just talking about the atmosphere in the streets. Yeah, New York can be rough and tumble. But, you know, I lived in Paris for four years, and nobody is colder than the French. If, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're lost and you walk up to someone asking for directions, they'll just say, I don't live in the neighborhood, and they just blow you off. New Yorkers tend to be nice about it. They'll stop and say, no, you, go, you have to go there and do that. And I think New Yorkers tend to be not the cliché stereotype film New Yorker, but they tend to be pretty, pretty nice people uh, with strangers in that way.
They unlike folk, other cities. Paul say no one is colder than the French. They speak well of you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Lots of people say nice things about me. It doesn't mean that I think that all their habits are so good. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, you know, talking about the, the way it's changed. I mean, I remember the first time I came here, I think 1972, 73, I had a college friend, an American guy, who had somehow inherited a very rundown apartment building at, in St. Mark's Place, and which he had, because he had then discovered that he was gay, he had filled it with gay Cuban refugees, mm. who he, all of whom he called Raul. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was me and my friend who came from a Mayflower family and the Raouls. <laughs> and, and we were in this, this, this building on St. Mark's Place and, and I called the one or two people I knew who had more money and lived in fancier places uptown, and they said, where are you staying? And I said, well, I'm in this house on St. Mark's Place. And they said, no, you have to leave. You, you have to leave now. Um, I'm going to send a car. What year, you know, what year is this? 1972. Okay. And, um, and I said, what, you mean because of the crack dealers on the doorstep? And they said, no, don't make jokes. You don't understand. You have to move out now. And I didn't. And what I discovered is with the crack dealers, because they were, is that once they discovered that you got no money, right, that they can't, they can't rob you and they can't sell you anything, then they say, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> so, 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 so it was in that New York, it was actually a real advantage to have no money. It was safer to have no money, you know. And, and you had to walk across town in a sort of strange way because some blocks were okay and some blocks were not okay. So you had to walk kind of like that across, across town. And I loved it. I loved it. I fell in love with it because the other side of it was that it was very youthful because it was cheap. And it was full of young creative people of all kinds, you know, writers, filmmakers, painters, musicians, everybody. And I thought, how good is this, you know? And that's when I thought I want to I want to put myself here and see what happens. I mean, by the time I got here, that city really no longer existed. But I remember it both as it was dangerous. Listen, there were apartments that were rented for $49 a month yeah. back when I was yeah. a student, yeah. you know, in that, in that yeah. part of the town. That's why that's what's under assault, right? The youthful creativity, right? It's hard to create when you have 18 yeah. roommates and, you know, sharing a bathroom. Um, it, it's become um, the, the art, I think, the ability to come here and just you know, subsist and in some way transmute what the experience is like and then create art out of it, I think is under assault because yeah. of of um, what you mentioned with, you know, it's becoming a city of the extremely wealthy. Mm. <laughs> I, yeah. I want to tell Sergio a story, uh, speaking of crime. Uh, the first neighborhood in Brooklyn that I lived in was Carroll Gardens. This was, I moved in January 1980, so 38 and a half years ago or so. Uh, it was all Italian then, and it was a lot of uh, mob influence still. And I had a little railroad flat on Carroll Street, and my landlord was a very nice guy, John Caramello and his wife Jackie. They had inherited the building from one of the parents, and they were more or less my age. They were early 30s, and um, one day I was upstairs working, and I heard a big commotion down on the street. And so I went down to see what was going on, and Big John was there in the doorway. I said, what, what's going on? He said, well, a guy got out of prison today, and he was going down the block, breaking into apartments and robbing people. And then I said the stupidest thing I've ever said in my life. I said, did you call the police? <laughs> he said, oh, no, no. He said, they took care, the boys took care of him. They, they, they broke his legs and they put him in a taxi and sent him on his way and he'll never be back. So that was Carol Garden's Justice, 1980, yeah. Did you ever feel like um, you guys, like even one wandering around, I was in the green room earlier, I, I was saying one of the, the, the one of my favorite moments was uh, 
um, seeing Salman Rushdie on the the subway, and it's it pro probably about uh, I don't know 12 years ago or something, and and I think something had gone wrong with a car or something like that, and we and we ended up chatting on the on the subway, and I thought, how wonderful is that 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 you know the, that that it's you know everyone feels comfortable um, you know getting getting around in the city. Well, you know, I mean, I mean, I you know, I take take the subway, you know, sometimes. Um, <laughs> Did you do city bike? No, no, no. no. No, no, that's, no, I think cycling in this city, that's scary. Yeah, so I think no, I, that, I'm, I'm not getting on no two-wheel thing, you know, without armor around me. You, know, not you never that. know, your subway might be two wheels at this no. stage, and the way, the way yeah, things are going. Yeah. But you do have, I mean, I have had the experience on the subway of sitting across from somebody who I thought was drunk and unconscious, who turned out to be dead. <laughs> I thought, okay. I'll just through get no that. fault of your own. Through no fault of my own. I was not involved. <laughs> I was not involved. It was two other guys. And, and so I just thought, I'll just get off at the next station and go on my way. On my yeah, exactly. So, you know, but I mean, I think the subways, I mean, the London subway is not different, really. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's also, a, depending on the time of night, it can be a while. Is it closed, though? No, no it does close. Yeah. That's right. It closes at like amateurs. Yeah, amateurs, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, not, not amateurs. They're just British. <laughs> they like to sleep. Um, anyway, so yeah, I mean, I take the subway. You know, I take the subway to Yankee Stadium all the time. So I want to um, switch this a little uh, in 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 the sense and and um, talk about these books because these books are they all have these vast expansive, daring canvases. And each of these writers, um, in their own way, are pushing the form. And I suppose every writer should be sort of pushing the form. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut says that we should be continually jumping off of cliffs and developing our wings on the way down. Um, and I think that, that, that somehow uh, each, of the, each of you do this um, in, in tremendous ways. I wonder. Is New York an influence on that? Or, uh, I mean, if you're writing a New York novel, does it push you into new literary territory? And does New York itself influence the language uh, as it uh, ends up presenting itself on the page? I don't think so. Um, I, I, I think if I had grown up in Chicago, I'd probably be very interested in the whole history of Chicago, just the way I'm interested in New York. Everyone comes from somewhere. Salman is talking about being uprooted and planting himself in a new place, but you're still here now. I mean, we're not living in 12 places at once. No. And um, the place that we get to know, the, our, our surroundings become fascinating to us because everything is fascinating. And, and I think people in New York are fascinated by New York, but you know, I, it's true of any city or any country side, yeah. any, anywhere. I think what's true about having come I mean, not the kind of New York novel that I cannot write is the kind of novel that would be written by somebody who was born and raised here, mm. you know? And I wouldn't try to write that, you know? Um, so my experience is coming from one, growing up in one huge metropolis, then living in another huge metropolis, and then arriving in this one, you know? And, and they're not that dissimilar. If you're used to the life of the big city, you adjust really not, with not that much difficulty to the life of another big city. I sometimes think it's a bigger journey to come from some small town in the Midwest to New York City than to come from Bombay to New York City. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so in that sense, no, I don't think it changes. What it does change, as Paul says, is it changes the subject because you know, the stuff out of your window is interesting. Right. You know? and, and it's true that my recent work has been much more located here than anywhere else, and that's because I am. Um, and language, you know, I think one of the things if you're, if you're any good as a writer is you have, to have a, you have to have a good ear. You have to be able to hear how people really speak, and you have to hear what's really happening in their heads. And, and that's different, so that, yeah, that effect, that's affected, but that's just the normal business of writing. And well, similar to what I said earlier, I think the shape shiftiness of, of the city makes it somehow less influential. But influence is hard to 
kind of identify from within and say, it doesn't influence me, it does influence me. You, know, you say, that's exactly what somebody who's influenced would say, it doesn't influence you. You know, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a sense in which you don't know um, what effect having grown up in this area plays in the work. And there's another sense in which you don't really much care. Mm -hmm. um, but it does feel to me that growing up in a place that's, you know, uncommon, that growing up in in Tulsa or growing up, that that would somehow find its way into the work more. There are, li there are little gifts that the big city gives you every day. Like, you know, if one of the things I love is it used to be the case that if somebody was walking down the street talking to themselves, they'd be mad. <laughs> now everybody's talking to themselves. You, know, <laughs> you walk down the street and everybody is telling you their life story. <laughs> you know, they're telling you how they're fighting with their girlfriend or what, how they lost their job today or it's all just out there, right. you know, and, and they're not crazy. They're just wired, mm -hmm. you know. Right. <laughs> so that's, I mean, the kind of thing which I suspect doesn't happen in L.A. But the first time I saw that, I did think that person was crazy. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> then, then, I, then I realized. Uh, but in L.A. where nobody walks, right. that doesn't happen. If you walk too far in L.A., they arrest you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I want to ask about the, 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 the characters um, in, in, in these novels. Um, Archie, Archie Ferguson. Um, well, can you tell, tell us the, the story of where the Ferguson name came from? It came from a, a, the oh. Hebrew mistake originally? Well, actually, let me read the first paragraph of the book. Sure. I think I, it's funnier if I get... What, you have the book in your... Oh, it's, no. it's right under... <laughs> <laughs> let me take out my book. It's, it's all inscribed right my heart. in the lens of... I don't have it memorized. The book is here. <laughs> but as a background, yeah. I have this. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is actually an old joke. I didn't make this joke up. The first name I made up, but the, um, this is something that's been circulating for a long time. So anyway, here's the first paragraph, and then you know how Ferguson got to be Ferguson. According to family legend, Ferguson's grandfather departed on foot from his native city of Minsk with 100 rubles sewn into the lining of his jacket, traveled west to Hamburg through Warsaw and Berlin, and then booked passage on a ship called the Empress of China, which crossed the Atlantic in rough winter storms and sailed into New York Harbor on the first day of the 20th century. While waiting to be interviewed by an immigration official at Ellis Island, he struck up a conversation with a fellow Russian Jew. The man said to him, forget the name Reznikov. It won't do you any good here. You need an American name for your new life in America, something with a good American ring to it. Since English was still an alien tongue to Isaac Reznikov in 1900, he asked his older, more experienced compatriot for, for a suggestion. Tell them you're Rockefeller, the man said. You can't go wrong with that. <laughs> an hour passed, then another hour, and by the time the 19-year-old Reznikov sat down to be questioned by the immigration official, he had forgotten the name the man had told him to give. Your name, the official asked, slapping his head in frustration. The weary immigrant blurted out in Yiddish, Ich hab vergessen, I've forgotten. And so it was that Isaac Reznikov began his new life in America as Ichabod Ferguson. <laughs> so he sounds like a Scottish Presbyterian, but he's not. Yeah. Um, so there, yeah. But there's not one Archie, there are four. The book is uh, uh, a, a kind of whirling cycle of uh, rotating stories of alternate possible lives for the same genetic character. And so um, the, it plays out in this great vortex of stories, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's hard to say, who's Archie? Well, he's, well I, could, I could tell you Archie 1, Archie 2, Archie 3, Archie 4. They're did, all, did you feel uh, a little bit like your, your, your friend Philippe Petit? You were on the tightrope balancing all these, 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 these four guys together? No, I, 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 I had a firm grasp of the difference between them all, I never felt confused or lost about it. Um, it was a quite an exhilarating book to write. I, I felt I was dancing throughout the whole thing. There was this kind of spin to it. And, um, uh, and the book is almost purely improvised. I had no idea what I was doing from day to day. And yet it was there. It almost seemed to be 
inside me already and I was just pulling it out. So you feel like an, an explorer. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I like to live dangerously as a novelist. Mm -hmm. I don't, if you, if you have it all mapped out in advance and it's all there, why bother to write the book? I mean, for me, it's discovering every day yeah. what, 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 what's coming up out of you. You're not, you're not even conscious of where the material's coming from. And in fact, in a certain way, the less you know, the better it's going to be. There's all the art and craft involved, of course. You want to make and have to make good sentences and so on. But where it's coming from, who knows? And you have to be open, very, very open to it in order uh, to get the down to the bottom of whatever it is you're you're looking for. That notion that Vallejo talks about that mystery mystery joins these mystery joins things together. Um, Nero, Nero Golden. Yeah, well, I was just thinking as Paul was talking that there's two things that echo each other in, between these two books. One is that the the main characters of my book also don't have their real names. You know, um, they. Nero Golden, not really called Nero Golden. Um, and the other thing is this improvisational technique, because I, because I find myself using that more and more as a way of writing. You know, like early on, like when I was writing Midnight's Children, that book, the events in the book are so closely mapped onto actual historical events that, that I really had to plan it. I had to see how this goes with that, et cetera. You know, I had to have that architecture. And what I find now is that this, what Paul describes as this daily discovery is a much more exciting but way. But you see, Salman, you and I have probably been doing this for just a about while. 50 years now. Yeah. And so uh, it's, 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 it's... So we know how to do it. Well, it's in our bodies. <laughs> it's, it's in the body. You're not, you don't have to think about it yeah. in the same way you did when you were 20. No, no, that's true. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so yeah, in my case, the, 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 the reinvention... Uh, of the family is for reasons that they don't want to reveal and which turn out to be quite frightening, and etc. Um, and it, one of the things that I ask myself and that actually quite a few people have asked me is, is that possible? Is it possible to come from somewhere to, to completely change your identity, to give up the past, never look back at it, um, to have a new name, a new way of being, and make that work? Can you do that? And, and I think the answer is that in real life, yes, you probably can. And that I think the streets of New York are full of people like that, you know, who've come from everywhere and have very often, like Ichabod Ferguson, either had their name changed on them or simplified it or whatever, and have become new people in the new place. You know, I think in real life, people do it. In a novel, you can't do it. In a novel, if you're running away from the past, it would be a very weird novel if the novel said, well, never mind about all that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so this is the story of America. People went out west to yeah. reinvent themselves. Yeah. And they would change their names, and they would leave behind their families and, yeah. and start all over but again. But in fiction, yeah. if you're running away from something, it's got to come and get you. Right. <laughs> you know? so, how, so about, how about Nuno, Nuno De Angelis? Oh, I don't know. I really don't know what to say about somebody like that. Um, I feel, except that I miss him, maybe, in a weird way. Like, I always feel, and part of what the novel is about, this particular novel about was about for me, is what it means to create a fictional world and then people it would, what are theoretically fictive entities, but if you're doing it right, end up feeling more real than some of the people you encounter in your day-to-day -day life. And... I mean, it's kind of overt in, in the narrative, but I started thinking about what it means for those stories to end and how they mirror and in many ways differ from what our lives, the story of our life. So the strange thing about, about a novel and the characters in it is that when the novel ends, in a way, it's as if they've died, that they will not continue to act in any way. But then if you kind of open the book at random to a certain page, they may theoretically be as alive as they've ever been, which kind of mirrors some weird thoughts I was having about what, I feel like we're probably going a bit too far afield. Maybe we could go to a bar afterwards or something, but like kind of mirrors the way I view time and the way that we are 
in many ways trapped inside this linear procession, but that that might not reflect the ultimate reality of what time actually is and what our existence actually is. I Just middle minor things like that. I, ask, I, I want to ask Sergio a question, because it, it's very interesting that you're, you're doing two things. Not many people can do two things. What started first for you? Was it the, uh, did you start as a lawyer and find writing later? Or did you want to be a writer and did law to uh, have a, a living? Uh, no, I would say what, the, what the, writing, the writing preceded it because I was, you know, um, probably started writing when I was like seven years old. I but see. I wasn't practicing law yet. Uh. And I, I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't analyzing <laughs> cases. Um, but... <laughs> The law is actually wrapped up. Um, I think a lot of, I, I tend to find that a lot of my lawyer colleagues, uh, oddly enough, have writerly ambitions in ways that maybe exceeds the average person because the practice of law is tied up with language yeah. um, in a way that, that um, let's just say the two, the two uh, main areas that I devote my time to, they feel of a piece. They don't feel too random. It's not like I, you know, I'm writing a novel and then I'm doing something completely different. They feel kind of informed by each other. Well, there's a, a poet I like very much, Charles Reznikoff. Uh, for, you know, he, he died 45 years ago. Um, he studied law, and he said that studying law was very helpful to him in becoming a poet, that the study of law forced him to weigh each word very carefully, and this is the, exactly the skill he needed to become a poet. You know, one of Gaddis's last... No, his penultimate novel was called A Frolic of His Own. Yeah. And he would kind of create these, these um, fictitious but very funny legal opinions. And, and he mentioned something similar to what you're saying, which is that he found that the practice of law, they'll debate a whole day about whether that clause mm -hmm. uh, should be subordinate to the one that comes before it because the meaning changes entirely if you move that comma. And it's true that there is this kind of d deep dive yeah, yeah. into language that occurs in both professions. Um, I will say that um, the, the writing of novels is often far more entertaining than... Uh, <laughs> not, so not always. Than drafting a contract. Not always. Not always but <laughs> I, will, I'll, I don't like to brag, but I think my novel is more interesting than your average contract. I'll just put <laughs> a bold assertion, but I guess... Uh, 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 well, all I'll say is I was... My, my father's plan for me was that I was going to be a lawyer. And I rebelled. And um, he was very upset. Um, in fact, when I told him I was going to, wanted to be a writer, this cry burst out of him, completely uncontrollable. He said, what will I tell my friends? <laughs> <laughs> and because I wasn't going to have you know, the words bar at law after my name. You know? But you, like Joyce, uh, would spend, uh, could spend hours, and if not the full day, which uh, in the famous apocryphal story about Joyce, um, putting the comma in and put, or yeah. putting the full stop in and put, taking the full yeah. stop out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's you know, the famous story about Flaubert. He would come, come down from his office after a day's work, say he had a great day because he wrote a sentence. Right. You know? <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, I think Look, there's no rule. Sometimes, some days it's fast and some days it's slow. Yeah. You know, I mean, some, um, and the thing you get better at, I hope, is recognizing when it's right. Right. So uh, you guys, I mean, all of us, we, 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 work, we work very hard. Um, and, you know, you're there in the morning. And I think most, most of us probably don't work, work that hard. No, you, don't work, you don't work that hard? <laughs> all right. But I wanted to ask you then, like, uh, a, a more frivolous question, uh, that going away from the language and the, and the books. But at the end of the day, um, is there a bar or a restaurant in New York that you find uh, is the place where you can go and lick your wounds or go and, or, or is there a favorite place that, 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 that you happen to have? How about you, Sergio? It's actually a place I was at last night that I've gone to many times. It's called, I'm not sure if it's called The Park or Park. It's like a restaurant and there's a fucking park inside of it. Like there's an actual tree and like birds flying around, but you're indoors. <laughs> Where is this, in Brooklyn? It's, what is it, like 17th and 10th <laughs> or something, oh, right? Somebody knows it. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, it's a nice place, but it just happens to have taken on some kind of um, significance in my life because I was there for certain things. And so I still enjoy going there um, often. My wife and I have dinner there quite often, and it has a bar and, and all. all right. And a park. And it's a park. And you can go on the swings and... Not that kind of park. No. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, one of the... 
kind of New York answers to this question is that there is a place that I like, but it's been closed. <laughs> <laughs> the ever-changing city. Yeah. There I, one I, day, gone the next. I used to like, you know, Temple Bar not far from here, you know, um, and yeah, you see, and, and I mean, I liked it in itself. I also liked it because the name is an echo of an area of Dublin that I like, you know, and, and um, uh, yeah, I would go there, and now I can't. <laughs> So, and, and what about restaurants? What about restaurants? Well, I like the Noho Star as well. That's gone too. Okay, the Noho Star is <laughs> <So>, gone. <laughs> right uh -oh. next to it. How about you, Paul? Well, in my youth, I, I loved going to bars. And um, the, the one I went to as a student was the West End, which is a, is a famous bar. Um, and I don't know, this is where I hung out for four straight years. It was probably spent more time there than in my apartment. Um, <laughs> And you know, there's a great old tradition there. The bartender had been there forever. Dylan Thomas used to drink there. He loved to talk about that. And the students were there. The hangers-on were there. The winos were there. It was a, it was a great place. It's gone now. And uh, I've never had a connection with a bar since then in that way. But now, you know, as you say, writing takes a lot out of you. And as you know, I live with another writer, Siri Hustvedt, my wife. And we're both working all day hard. By the time we get to it's five o'clock or so, we're wiped out. Uh, it's, I feel as if I've been running all day uh, and that I'm mentally exhausted. And we just tend to hang out together if we don't have some plans to see friends. We just, you know, have a little wine and just start relaxing. And then often we'll just chill out with a baseball game or an old movie and just, I, I think the important thing about writing novels is once you stop for the day, don't think about it anymore. Just leave it behind mm -hmm. and let your unconscious do the work and yeah. go to sleep and you'll, you'll feel better and smarter in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, much, I'm much happier in the baseball season because, because it's a way of switching your brain off. Yeah. You know, you, you could just, you finish a day's work and you just sit down and there's a game and the game has its own rhythms and its own rules and you could just be there for a while and not, and not here. Um, so I do watch a lot of sports, but I also watch a lot, watch a lot of like trash television. Like if I rerun a three's companies on, I can, you know, I'll watch, the, I'll watch a marathon of that. We are um, we're, we're 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 getting towards the end here, unfortunately, because I think we could we could have we could sit. Actually, we need a bottle of wine. That's what we need a bottle of wine, like, and then really get into it. But um, what I wanted to to, to ask you guys, um, all present company um, accepted, if there was a New York novel that you wanted to talk about, uh, what would that what what would that novel be, um, and or if one that you had to carry away to some sort of New York desert island? If you went to Rikers, for instance, uh, you know, and. Uh, Ended up in Rikers. What, what novel would you bring with you? You're limiting it to New York, so I would say Invisible Man, probably. Oh, tell me why. I mean, it perfectly marries aesthetic concerns while still having, let's call it, a more revolutionary message to it. It manages to pull off both, and that's a high wire act that's rarely pulled off. So, I mean, all my novels are, in essence, trying to foment nonviolent revolution. But I failed twice, so now it's like the third time. <laughs> that one, I feel like, is like a, a touchstone for exactly that kind of intent. And, and I think it, it, it's not a perfect novel, but it, that's what I'd bring. Thank you. I, you know, it's funny you say, uh, Ralph Ellison, because before I had ever come to New York, I had read Invisible Man, and it had a colossal impact on me because of the surrealism of it, which is completely rooted in the everyday world, you know, that uh, grows out of the everyday world. And I thought that's something to learn from, try and do it. So yeah, I mean, I'd have Invisible Man, but I don't know what. I mean, there was a point when Bello had a very big effect on me, you know, and um, I remember when I was writing Fury, I realized, almost as I was finishing it, that there was something very similar in my novel to Mr. Samler's Planet. 
which is also about a man wandering around the Upper West Side, wondering what the hell is wrong with his life, you know. And and I mean, it has Mr. Sandler's Planet has some problems, including the notorious scene about the black man exposing himself. Um, but it is the thing I admire about it is the way in which the interior, the kind of if, let's say stream of consciousness, is as exciting as external events. You know, that, and that ability to make thinking exciting is something which that novel does brilliantly and, and again, is a thing to learn from, I think. I would um, uh, throw out an earlier book. I, I've been, I'm writing about Stephen Crane now. I'm, I'm working on a book about Crane and I've been reading him and rereading him and learning more and more about him. You know, he, he, he had a very short life. He died at 28. Um, his first novel, Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, he, he was published when he was 21, 1893. It's an extraordinary book about New York City, about the slums. Um, it's generally considered, and I, it's my feeling, but I, I keep asking, you know, uh, American literature professor, right? This is the first modernist novel in American writing. Yes, everyone agrees with me. The book is a hallucination. It's a visionary poem. You know, people call him a realist, naturalist. It's nonsense. It's it's something. It's right out of um, a, a black painting by Goya, and it's seething. The language is so alive, and it's short. It's just a novella. It's about 75 pages, but it's one of the most powerful things I've ever read about New York, and it's eternal New York, poverty in New York, but. It's uh, just as relevant today as it ever was. That's wonderful. Well, yeah. I take I take all of you guys' work because I'm I'm allowed to do that because I I think that these novels are really fantastic. And before I give you one last chance to say anything that you want to in relation to your own relationship uh, to, to to New York City, I I, I do want to say that. Um, all the writers are going to be outside, they'll be signing books and you get a chance to, to, to shake their hand and talk to them and so on. Um, it's been such a pleasure uh, chatting with you. But I did want to give you guys each a chance, if there's anything that you wanted to say about your own relationship to New York or uh, li uh, uh, New York in literature itself um, to finish off the evening. And we'll begin with Paul. I'm finished. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> No, I have nothing to say about New York, but other than to thank New York for coming out tonight, I should have started that way. Thank you all for coming out. Yeah. It's certainly gratifying uh, to see any group collect over literature or books, you know, in 2018. So that was the highlight of, of the month for me. Yeah, I mean, you know, the World Voices Festival is something I've been very involved in since it was born. And I feel so proud, in a way, to have been able to be part of the group that offered the city something that it decided it wanted. You know, it's very hard in this city where everything is happening all the time um, to put something new into the cultural schedule. You know, and, and the fact that all of you for, what is it, 14, 15 years now have been coming back every year, that's, it's fantastic to know that, 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 that that's happened and that we now have an international literary festival in New York City. Um, other than that, all I want to say is, you know, I'm not leaving. <laughs> so, so please, please do support Penn um, and uh, a round of applause, please, for Paul Oster, Salman Rushdie, and Sergio Delapay. <laughs> <laughs>